Hi, everyone. Uh, today, I want to share with you two interesting science-related articles that I found um, while, while I was not paying attention in class. And I want to share them because I thought they were super interesting and just kind of go through them. So let's start with the article from Popular Mechanics called Scientists Believe They've Unlocked Consciousness and It Connects to the Entire Universe. Not clickbait at all. It's just a simple quantum wave that can intersect, interact with everything that's ever existed by Susan Leahy. Cool little image there. All right, let's go. When people talk about consciousness or the mind, the context almost always seems a bit nebulous. True. Whether we create consciousness in our brain as a function of our neurons firing or it exists independently of us, there's no universally accepted scientific explanation for where consciousness comes from or where it lives. However, new research on the physics, anatomy, and geometry of this mysterious notion has begun to reveal its possible form. In other words, we may soon be able to identify a true architecture for consciousness. The new work builds upon a theory that Nobel Prize winning physicist Roger Penrose, PhD, and anesthesiologist Stuart Hoffman, MD, first proposed in the 1990s, known as the Orchestrated Objective Reduction Theory, or ORC OR. Broadly, it claims that consciousness is a quantum process facilitated by microtubules in the brain's nerve cells. Okay, cool. What are microtubules? These are tubes. These are tubes made of protein lattices, and they form part of the cell's cytoskeleton, which is its structural network. So microtubules are made of are tubes made of protein lattices made of proteins inside of a cell inside of a cell inside of their structural network. Okay, Penrose and Hamoff, Hameroff suggested that consciousness is a quantum wave that passes through these microtubules and that, and that like every quantum wave, it has properties like superposition, the ability to be in many places at the same time, or all, position, all places at the same time, and entanglement, the potential for two particles that are very far away to be connected. Plenty of experts have questioned the validity of the orc or theory. This is the story of the scientists working to revive it. Across the universe, to explain quantum consciousness, Hammerfer recently said that it doesn't have a defined physical size. He compared it to a fractal, a never-ending pattern that can be very tiny, tiny or very huge and still maintains the same properties at any scale. Normal states of consciousness might be what we consider quite ordinary, knowing you exist, for example. But when you have a heightened state of consciousness, Hammerfer explains, it's because you're dealing with quantum level consciousness that is capable of being in all places at the same time. Wow. That means our, your consciousness can connect or entangle with quantum particles outside of your brain, anywhere in the universe, theoretically. Until recently, scientists could easily discard this theory. Efforts to recreate quantum, quantum coherence, keeping quantum particles as part of a wave instead of breaking down into discrete particles, worked only in very cold, controlled environments. When quantum particles were taken out of that environment, the wave broke down, leaving behind isolated particles. The brain isn't cold and controlled, it's quite warm and wet and mushy, so therefore we couldn't have superposition in the brain. Particles in the brain couldn't connect with the universe. But then came discoveries in quantum biology. As it turns out, living things use quantum properties even though they're not cold or controlled. Know your terms, quantum biology. This is the study of quantum processes in living organisms, organisms like superposition and quantum entanglement that eventually fact facilitate biological processes beyond the subatomic level. In photosynthesis in plants, for example, we use, they use chlorophyll in a process that stores the energy from a proton, proton or a quantum particle of light. The light hitting the plant causes the formation of something called an excitron, which carries the energy to where it is stored in the plant's reaction center. But to get it there, it has to navigate structures in the plant, sort of like navigating an, an unfamiliar neighborhood en route to a dentist appointment. And it has to complete the trip before it burns all the energy it's carrying. To find the correct path, scientists now say the excitron Excitron tries all possible paths simultaneously. That's superposition. Okay, I would also wonder about the different algorithm, like search algorithms in computer science, and whether to find the correct path, there are multiple ways rather than trying all possible paths simultaneously, I believe. So that's maybe something we want to check up on. New evidence suggests that microtubules in our brain may be even better than chlorophyll at maintaining this quantum coherence. One of the scientists worked with the ORC, ORC or team, physicist and oncologist Professor Jack Toguski, PhD, recently conducted an experiment with a computational model of a microtubule. 
His team simulated shining a light into a microtubule, sort of like a photon sending an excitron through a plant structure. If the light lasted long enough before being emitted, a fraction of a second was enough, it would indicate quantum coherence. Specifically, Toyotsky's team stimulated sending tryptophan fluorescence, an ultraviolet light photon that are not visible to the human eye, into microtubules. After conducting the experiment 22 times, Tajewski reported that the excitations from the tryptophan created quantum reactions that lasted up to five nanoseconds. That is, thousands of times longer than some may have expected a coherence to last in a microtubule. It also means more, uh, it also more than long enough it's also more than long enough to perform the biological functions required. So we are actually confident that this process is lasting longer in tubulin than in chlorophyll, he says. The team published their findings in the journal ACS Central Science earlier this year. Put simply, the brain is not too wet or warm for consciousness to exist as a wave that connects with the universe. Tzgutsky draws on similar experiments performed by scientists at the University of Central Florida, who have been illuminating microtubules with visible light. In, the, in these experiments, Tajitsky says researchers observed re-emission of this light over hundreds of milliseconds to seconds, a typical human response time to the stimulus. Shining the light into microtubules and measuring how long the microtubules take to emit that light is a proxy for the stability of certain postulated quantum states, he says. That is kind of key to the theory that these microtubules may be having coherent quantum positions that may superpositions that may be associated with mind or consciousness. Put simply, the blah blah blah. We just saw that the brain may not be too wet or too warm for consciousness to exist the wave that connects with the universe. While these experiments are a long way from paving the orc or theory, proving the orc or theory, they do offer significant and promising data. Meanwhile, Penrose and Hemeroff continue to push, push the boundaries of the theory partnering with people such as author and influencer Deepak Chopra to explore expressions of consciousness in the universe that they might be able to identify in the lab using their micro microtubule experiments. This sort of thing makes many scientists very uncomfortable. Still, other researchers are exploring what the architecture of such a universal consciousness may look like. One of the more compelling ideas comes from the study of weather. Architecture of Universal Consciousness. Timothy Palmer, PhD is a mathematical physicist at Oxford who specializes in chaos theory and the climate. He's also a big fan of Roger Penrose. Palmer believes that the laws of physics must be th fundamentally geometric, and he uses the invariant set theory to explain how the quantum world works. Among other thing things, it suggests that quantum consciousness is a result of the universe operating in a particular fractal geometry, geometric state space. State space, so... Let me just read that again. Among other things, it suggests that quantum consciousness is the result of the universe operating in a per particular fractal geom geom geometry, geometry state space. I think it would be geometric state space. State space essentially represents the possible configurations of any system. Okay, so it's all possible states. <clears throat> That is a lot to digest, but it roughly means we're stuck in a lane or root of a cosmic fractal shape that is shared by other realities that are also stuck in their own traje trajectories. This notion appears in the final chapter of Palmer's book, The Primacy of Doubt. In it, he suggests the possibility that our universe of free will, of having the option to choose our life, as well as our perception that there is a consciousness outside ourselves, is the result of awareness, is the result of awareness of other universes that share our state space. Interesting theory. <clears throat> the idea starts with a special geometry called the strange attractor. You may have heard of the butterfly effect, the idea that the flap of a butterfly's wing in one part of the world could affect a hurricane in another part of the world. The term actually refers to a more complex concept developed by the mathematician and meteorologist Edward Lorenz in 1963. Lorenz was trying to simplify the equations used to predict how a particular climate condition might evolve. He narrowed it down to three specific differential equations that could be used to identify the state space of a particular weather system, that all possible, a possible set of all sets uh, of states. For example, if you had a particular temperature, wind direction, and humidity level, what would happen next? He began, he began, he began to plot the trajectory of a weather system by plugging in different initial conditions into the equations. Cool photo. The Wren's attractor is a set of chaotic solutions of the Wren's system that, when plotted, resemble a butterfly or figure eight. Most people know it as a butterfly effect, and it's one way to help explain chaos. He found that if initial conditions were differentiated by, differentiated by even a hundredth of a percent, the trajectories could be wildly different. 
In the graph, one trajectory might shoot off in one direction, forming loops and spins seeming, seemingly at random, while another creates completely different shapes in the opposite direction. But once Lorenz started to plot them, he found that many of the trajectories wound up circulating within the boundaries of a particular geometric shape, known as a strange attractor. It was as if there, was a, if there were cars on track. The cars might go in any number of directions as long as they didn't drive in the same way twice, and they stayed on track. The plot, now called the Lorenz attractor, actually looks like a pair of butterfly wings. Okay. Palmer believes that our universe may be just one trajectory, one car on a cosmical state space like the Lorenz attractor. When we imagine what if scenarios, we're actually getting information about versions of ourselves in other universes who are also navigating the same, same strange attractors, other cars on the track, he explains. This also accounts for a sense of consciousness, of free will, and of being connected with the greater universe. I would at least hypothesize that it may well be the case that it's evolving on very special fractal subsets of all conceivable states in state space, Palmer tells Popular Mechanics. If his ideas are correct, he says, then we need to look at the structure of the universe on its very largest scales because these attractors are really telling us about a kind of holistic geometry for the universe. Tijinsky's experiments and Palmer's theory still don't tell us what consciousness is, but perhaps they tell us where consciousness lives. What kind of a structure houses it? That means it's not just ethereal, disembodied concept. If consciousness is housed somewhere, even if that somewhere is a complicated state space, we can find it, and that's a start. All right, very interesting article. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed I have one more to share. Um, I don't know if I should use on that. Um, essentially, what I took of that is that quantum processes potentially could be underlying consciousness. That's kind of like a basic, like those are just two buzzwords you can kind of mush together. And I've thought about that before, you know, is, is consciousness a quantum process? And basically this idea is that, okay, if quantum, if uh, consciousness is a quantum process, um, what would that look like? And this article basically was saying that it could be housed in these microtubules and that basically quantum processes can happen inside the body and it can happen in the brain um, so that maybe it is uh, quantum. And then because it's quantum, um, according to chaos theory, there's this thing that could result called a strange attractor. And that strange attractor may be a cause to think that we are somehow connected to all possible states. It's kind of like the multi multiverse and that there are different uh, versions of yourself living out there. It's kind of like some explanation behind why that may be true, some context. So interesting. I don't know if I buy it. We'll want to hear more. And I'm going to share uh, just one more article with you. Hopefully it's a bit shorter because that was a lot. And it sounds like my voice is going. So let's hear one more. <clears throat> this should be much easy, uh, easier to understand. Oh, wait, no, this is the wrong one again. Here we go. You can see this. Now let's go uh, share screen one more time. How obesity dismantles mitochondria. Study reveals key mechanisms behind obesity related metabolic dysfunction. Great. So this is talking about mitochondria and obesity. Let's look at this picture here. These colored streaks are mitochondrial networks within fat cells. Researchers from UC San Diego discovered that a high fat diet dismantles mitochondria, resulting in weight gain. Okay. San UC San Diego Health Sciences. Let's get into the article. The number of people with obesity has nearly tripled since 1975, resulting in a worldwide epidemic. While lifestyle factors like diet and exercise play a role in the development and progression of obesity, scientists have come to understand that obesity is also associated with intrinsic metabolic abnormalities. Now researchers from UC San Diego School of Medicine have shed light on how obesity affects our mitochondria, the all-important energy-producing structures of our cells. In a study published by Nature Metabolism, the researchers found that when mice were fed a high-fat diet, mitochondria within their fat cells broke apart into smaller mitochondria with reduced capacity for burning fat. Further, they discovered that this process is controlled by a single gene. Okay, so mitochondria, when they're in a super uh, fat environment, I guess, break apart into smaller mitochondria um, with reduced capacity for burning fat. Furthermore, they discovered this process is controlled by a single gene. By deleting this gene from mice, they were able to protect them from excess weight gain, even when they ate the same high-fat diet as other mice. Interesting. So the process by which mitochondria break down into smaller mitochondria is regulated by a single gene. When removing that gene, mitochondria, mitochondria stay large and thus have you know, their normal high ability to process fat. 
Wow, that's very interesting. Caloric overload overload from overeating can lead to weight gain and also triggers a metabolic cascade that reduces energy burning, making obesity even worse, said Alan Saltiel, PhD, professor in the Department of Medicine at UC San Diego School of Medicine. The gene we identified is a criti critical part of the transition from healthy weight to obesity. Obesity, which affects more than 40% of adults in the United States, crazy, occurs when the body accumulates too much fat, which is primarily stored in adipose tissue. Adipose tissue normally provides important me mechanical benefits by cushioning vital organs and providing insulation. It also has important metabolic functions, such as releasing hormones and other cellular signal and other cellular signaling molecules that instruct other tissues to burn, burn or store energy. In the case of caloric imbalances like obesity, the ability of fat cells to burn energy starts to fail, which is one reason why it can be difficult for people with obesity to lose weight. How these metabolic abnormalities start is among the biggest question mysteries surrounding obesity. To answer this question, the researchers fed mice a high-fat diet and measured the impact of this diet on their fat cells' mitochondria, structures within cells that help burn fat. We know, we know mitochondria are the powerhouse of cells. Come on, guys. They discovered an unusual phenomenon. After consuming a high-fat diet, mitochondria in, part, in parts of the mice's adipose tissue underwent fragmentization, splitting into smaller, ineffective mitochondria that burned less fat. In addition to discovering this metabolic effect, they also discovered that it is driven by the activity of a single molecule called RAIA. RAI has many functions, including helping break down mitochondria when they malfunction. The new research suggests that when this molecule is overactive, it interferes with the normal functioning of mitochondria, triggering the metabolic issues associated with obesity. In essence, chronic activation of RAIA appears to play a critical role in suppressing energy expenditure in obese adipose tissue, says Saltiel. By understanding this mechanism, we're one step by understanding this mechanism, we're one step closer to developing targeted therapies that could address weight gain and associated metabolic dysfunctions by increasing fat burning. By deleting the gene associated with RAIA, the researchers were able to protect the mice against diet-induced weight gain. Delving deeper into the biochemistry at play, the researchers found that some of the proteins affected by RAIA in mice are analogous to human proteins that are associated with obesity and insulin resistance, suggesting that similar mechanisms may be driving human obesity. The direct comparison between the fundamental biology we've discovered and real clinical outcomes underscores the relevance of the findings to humans and suggests we may be able to help treat or prevent obesity by targeting the RAIA pathway with new therapies, says Saltiel. We're only just beginning to understand the complex metabolism of these diseases. The future possibilities are very exciting. Awesome. Thank you guys for listening. Um, that was a little bit of a breakdown of I guess the molecular processes and different, uh, the differentiated mechanical, uh, metabolic and biological processes between quote unquote normal, normal person, a person that is, you know, has way too much fat inside of their body. Um, mitochondria breakdown, mod, uh, you know, modulated by one gene and that removing that gene keeps the mitochondria larger and thus able to break down fat easier. So essentially what it says at the end of the article is that if you were able to keep that uh, those mitochondria big and working properly, then it would be easy, easier for people with a lot of fat to lose, lose weight. But I, but I kind of thought people that were already fat lost weight quicker anyways. I don't know. Um, I don't even know if I really like this idea of Ozempic and all these like kind of miracle weight loss drugs. I think that people should be masters of themselves and that by kind of hacking their most fundamental aspects, it's kind of like cheating. I don't know. Cause also I want like a productive, healthy society, but it also just seems a little bit unfair that people that work out every day and eat clean, these people are just going to be like able to hack themselves. Um, I don't know this idea of like becoming superhuman, like this idea of becoming like being mal versus getting to normal level versus getting to superhuman level for whatever reason, there's a difference to me between like the efficacy is efficacy or eth efficacy. I don't know. I think it's worse um, for someone to go like, I think there's like, it's totally fine for someone to go from normal to superhuman. Um, but like this idea of like cheating from getting to, cause everyone can get here. And everyone should have the opportunity to get here, but you should be able to get here on your own. You can't get here on your own. So you should be able to get here, not on your own. But since you can get here on your own, you should not be able to get here, not on your own. That's kind of my point. And I don't know if that makes sense, 
but I've talked enough. I'm pretty tired. I should go work out and eat. Um, thanks for listening. I don't know if anyone's going to listen to this. This is Science Monday. Science Monday. Uh, probably not going to be a new segment, but maybe. Thanks for listening.